trains. Quite literally, they're all over the place. They come in all different sorts of packages. Fake trains, real trains, plastic trains, trains you can ride, trains that can destroy the environment, the list goes on. So imagine you're a composer. People think you're weird, but talented nonetheless. You're respectable, somewhat. You're looking at a train one day, and you think to yourself, hey, you can make a musical out of this. And with a little perseverance, some roller skates, and a Royal Shakespeare Company director who believes in it, you do. This is the story of Starlight Express. Like many kids growing up in Britain in the 1950s, Andrew Lloyd Webber devoured the Railway series by the Reverend W. Audrey, or Thomas and Friends, as it's known in the US. So it came as a welcome when the composer was asked to write a few songs for a TV pilot based on the series. By that point in time, Webber had seen great success with musicals like Jesus Christ Superstar and Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. And while the project fell through, the idea of writing a musical about trains stuck. A few years later, he was approached by another TV production company about writing an adaptation of Cinderella featuring trains. A famous prince was to hold a competition to decide which engine would pull the royal train across the United States of America. Cinderella was to be a steam engine, the ugly sisters were to be a diesel and an electric. Like Thomas before it, that never materialized either. But in the summer of 1982, hot off the success of Cats, Weber took his children to a rail yard in Connecticut. Inspired by their awe at the sight of a steam locomotive, the composer decided that that would be the subject of his next project. Lyricist Richard Stilgo was first introduced to Andrew Lloyd Webber when the composer was looking for someone to revise the opening number of Cats. Together, they wrote a few songs for a concert to be performed in schools like Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat had been. Trevor Nunn, who previously directed Cats, heard them and pitched a few ideas to Webber and Stilgo. It was decided that Starlight Express would be a musical extravaganza performed entirely on roller skates. Directed by Nunn and choreographed by Arlene Phillips, the birth of Starlight Express was beginning to take place. Though the creative team had been assembled, there was still one core component missing. What storytelling potential could come out of trains? Well, originally Weber conceived a story about a water pump named Rusty who wants to be an engine. The water pump angles was quickly dropped, and the element of having a competition of sorts was integrated in. In the end, the narrative would take place in the dreams of a kid referred to as Control, and it would be about trains from all over the world gathering to take place in the World Championship races. Rusty would be a corroded and often bullied steam engine. Through the power of the mystical Starlight Express, he learns to believe in himself and eventually wins the race and the heart of the pearl, the first class coach. After scheduling a workshop to be presented in front of potential investors, Phillips was given the difficult task of bringing anthropomorphic trains to life. She had only skated once in life before, and was forced to teach herself before turning over to a cast. We were looking for actors, singer, dancers who could also skate, a tall order in London where roller disco was unknown. One by one, each person was asked to skate. They did so, right into the table where we were sitting. Next, we went to the streets and parks in search of Skater. We watched them do tricks and stunts and thought that at last our luck was in. Brilliant enough, they were. Many had difficult singing Happy Birthday in tune, and could not skate and dance in time to the music. Two weeks of a six-week workshop were set aside as a boot camp. Professional performers were taught how to skate, and skaters were taught how to sing and dance. An unpolished version of the first act was presented before investors in early 83 to wide acclaim. With funding secured, Starlight Express was booked for a March 1984 opening. Everything was coming together perfectly. The main cast was finalized to Rachel as Rusty, Stephanie Lawrence as Pearl, Rusty's love interest, Jeff Shankly as Greaseball, and Elvis impersonating Diesel Train, Frances Raphael as Dinah, a dining car who struggles with her relationship to Greaseball, Jeffrey Daniels as Electra, a futuristic electric train, <laughs> 
and Michael Staniforth as CB, a two-faced caboose who serves as the show's twist villain. The Apollo Victoria Theatre was selected to host a show, which presented its own series of conundrums. Actors would need enough surface area to skate and perform stunts, so several of the theatre's front rows were removed to expand the stage and add sections of track. This then connected to an elaborate multi-story racetrack that ran through the sides and back of the theatre. Actors reached different levels of the track via the show's central icon, a six-ton iron bridge that could be raised, lowered, and swivel 360 degrees. When actors skated out of the audience's sights, their movements would be tracked by video monitors set up along the sides of the stage. The elaborate design, drawn by Napier himself, was extremely impressive, but also extremely dangerous to work with. If, during one of the races, an actor arrived at the bridge before it was completely lined up, then they either would have fallen for the gap or been crushed between the two platforms. This occurred on a few occasions. One night during the climax, Jess Shankly was so engaged with the fight he and Jeffrey Daniels were performing that he nearly fell into the bolt below. The show had to be stopped and marshals were later added in as safety features. Another time, Nancy Wood, who played Buffy the Buffet Car, came flying off one of the ramps and into the audience below. Thankfully, no one was hurt, and this is what led to the addition of netting around the stage. Incidents such as these only further added to the risk factor involved with starring in the show. Rehearsals for the earlier workshop were tame in comparison to those leading up to the beginning of previews. Due to the nature of roller skates and the choreography, risk of injury was high, especially for the non-skaters of the cast, and the toll this took on performers was intense. Understudies have replaced injured or recovering performers were in very high demand. In fact, there were only ever four shows that featured the complete original cast. March 27th, 1984. Opening night. The suspense was terrible. Audiences anxious to know what they'd gotten themselves into. Skeptical critics waiting to see what the Catman would do next. And if that wasn't enough, the royal family was even in attendance. All the cast could do was just pray we wouldn't fall. The show went off perfectly without a hitch. Well, at first. During the second act, a BBC news van pulled up outside the theatre to get ready for broadcast. They were supposed to get audiences thoughts as they exited the theatre momentarily. But notice that anyone involved, the van's radio transmitter broadcast in the same frequency as the microphones being used on stage. So both Stephanie Lawrence's big solo number and the show's finale were interlaced with unwanted sound from the van. Pretty embarrassing for everyone involved. So in spite of technical mishaps, what did people think of this labor of love and roller skates? Depends on who you ask. Audiences loved it. The first night of previews, the cast received three standing ovations. The Queen even said she liked it. Critics, on the other hand? They tore into it like teething puppies. The spectacle was incredible, no doubt about that, they said. But the story itself was... something left to be desired. The show here in London is expecting its fifth millionth visitor later this week. As the years went by, Starlight 8 rotated through countless casts and tweaks to the material that would culminate in the early 90s. The show saw a major renovation to every aspect that almost completely alienated it from what it was upon opening. Scenes were re-choreographed, the set refurbished, songs removed and new ones added. But most drastic of all was the removal of the character of CB, leaving the story without its main villain. But no matter how much the show changed, audiences never failed to come back, and it was this adoration that ensured the show's future for years to come. But as with most musicals, the end had to come eventually. On January 12, 2002, Starlight Express closed after 17 years and 7,406 performances, making it the 7th longest running musical in the West End. 20 years after its closure, Starlight Express leaves behind a vibrant legacy that lives on to this day. 
people recall it by name as one of the biggest, most awe-striking shows to hit the West End. During its lifespan in London, more productions of Starlight launched all across the globe, Broadway, Japan, Australia, and an elaborate one in Germany that's still running to this day. Even after it closed, tours would take Starlight across the UK and continental United States. The whole world would feel a tinge of its influence in one form or another. Just as Rusty found a way to surge from the ashes of defeat and find himself in the Starlight Express, so did the show itself. Despite the takedown of critics, it found its way to stardom through the unwavering support of audiences and a crew who believed it was possible. And what more could a musical possibly need?